Okay, I think we can probably get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Maurice Sotelli. Um, I work at Holburg University, Denmark, and I'm chairing this you know, uh, very promising and interesting exploratory paper session uh, titled Built, Lived, and Aging Spaces. And as you guess, all four papers that we have today uh, deal with space and, and you now uh, designing, co-designing, and, and you now shaping it in a uh, participatory way. Um, let me anticipate that I enjoyed a lot reading those four papers. They were very nice. And, and it's very also interesting how they touch upon issues of participation of the role of the designers and so on in very different ways among each other, although they you know, insist on a similar um, dimension having to be with you know, living and inhabiting uh, places and spaces. Um, as you can see, we have four papers. Uh, there will be time you now to uh, look at all of them. The structure is the usual with the videos. Um, and then uh, short clarifying questions that I invite all of you to put in the chat. Um, and then uh, a final moment uh, for a collective uh, conversation. And uh, Paulina, if we want to uh, do next. And uh, um, I would like to you know, engage with the, uh, this very uh, challenging and promising ritual of the acknowledgement of traditional custodian and territories in my own uh, mother tongue. So uh, I'm, I guess not everyone will understand, but we parlo da Olborg in Danimarca, ma sono cittadino italiano nato in Italia, cresciuto in Italia. Sia Danimarca che Italia hanno una lunga storia coloniale fatta di uh, varie forme di estrattivismo e abuso. E vorrei prima di tutto riconoscere i sacrifici eh, ed esprimere il mio rispetto per tutte le vittime del colonialismo italiano e danese, e, in, sostanzialmente tutti i continenti uh, abitati. Um, ma voglio anche riconoscere e portare il mio rispetto a tutte le persone che si sono opposte uh, a, al colonialismo in Danimarca e in Italia, oltre che nei luoghi um, oggetto uh, della colonizzazione. Questo non può che um, farmi pensare uh, e uh, omaggiare uh, chi si prende cura oggi uh, um, del territorio e della terra e delle relazioni in Danimarca e in Italia, ehm, includendo coloro che si oppongono alle nuove forme di colonialismo che hanno la faccia e la, la tecnica uh, di barriere e di ostacoli all'ingresso e delle frontiere. Um, con questo ringraziamento vorrei iniziare questa sessione che... Uh, ci permetterà uh, sperabilmente uh, di andare uh, oltre uh, le forme di abuso che ho ricordato. And, um, yeah, uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, Paulina, we can go to the next uh, slide, please. Um, now that are the guidelines uh, for being together. Uh, you have seen, if you have attended our sessions, you have seen the slides uh, again, but it's basically try to know, keep your microphone muted, uh, acknowledge that we are in a collective space and that you know, we are here to have meaningful conversation and respectful and mindful of, of others. Um, pardon everyone, in case of technical issues and constraints, we should have been used to them you know, in in more than two years uh, since uh, COVID came uh, into the world. And, um, and then now um, we will now um, 
record the session if you are fine with it. Uh, if you wish to be anonymous, please turn your camera off and try to de-identify yourself on, on Zoom. Um, we invite you uh, to do the same ritual of acknowledgement of traditional custodian and lands that no, I did in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, also remind you that if you have questions, please ask them in the chat and uh, then I will, you know, I will pick them up uh, later on. So we are ready uh, to start with the first paper. Um, it's all the words, it's not necessary all of the words, balancing authenticity and authority in participatory heritage projects by Hattie Rowling, Simon Bowen and, and David Kirk. And uh, Hattie is here with us uh, to answer questions. And, uh, but we have, I think we can start with the first video then. I'm Hattie Rowling, and in this presentation, I'm going to cover the main points from our exploratory paper. It's all their words, it's just not necessarily all of the words. Balancing authenticity and authority in participatory heritage projects. This paper covers the exploratory phase of a larger project working with a community run oral history charity based in the northeast of England to explore issues around designing for and doing participatory heritage. Before I get going, I'd just like to welcome you all to this presentation, regardless of your location, background, ancestry or heritage. And I'm really pleased that we have this opportunity to come together globally to exchange ideas through the PDC conference. So here I'm just going to give a brief snapshot, as it were, of some of the key ideas and issues that underpin this research and which are helpful in understanding the findings of discussion. Um, more detail on the background can, of course, be found in the paper itself. Um, a, a key concern at the minute in heritage studies uh, and something that's important when thinking about participatory heritage is how to avoid reinforcing the authorised heritage discourse. This is a phrase coined by Laura Jane Smith in her 2006 book, Uses of Heritage, and put simply is the idea that there's a single overarching heritage narrative constructed by experts and which often underpins and informs the identity of the nation state. The prevalence of AHD means there's little space for differing and alternative voices in the heritage narrative, and much that's important in the heritage of a nation or area goes unrecorded and is lost, because groups such as women, the working class, immigrants and other marginalised groups are not recorded in the heritage narrative. Another issue with the AHD is that privileging certain expert voices over others, or over those with lived experience, creates stewards of the past with an innate and almost unchallengeable authority. Recently, there's been greater focus on democratising heritage. However, sometimes there is a danger that community involvement fails to address the power imbalance between the experts and the community, and so merely encourages the community to engage with the dominant narrative, rather than provide space for challenges to this. One area that has had success in incorporating and uncovering different voices are oral history projects. This has been the case since the 1970s, when oral history as a discipline took a more subjective turn and sought to record experiences rather than uncover a single objective truth. Oral history projects, especially in the UK, are often community-based and community-driven projects, keen to highlight previously unheard voices from groups often excluded from the authorised heritage discourse. However, these community projects can sometimes be wary of engaging critically, instead wishing to show a nostalgic, overly positive version of the past and ignore those aspects that are more troubling or negative. Sometimes this is driven by nostalgia, but it can also be driven by a desire not to put the community down or offend people. And exploring how participatory heritage projects, particularly those involving oral history, can be structured to challenge the authorised heritage discourse while avoiding slipping into uncritical nostalgia was a key concern in this study. Um, so I'm just going to briefly outline the methods um, that we use for this study. Uh, obviously a fuller methodology section is in the paper itself. Um, but this study consisted of four semi-structured interviews with six members of the community oral history group we were working with. The interviews were grouped by role and there were slightly different interview guides used according to the role to ensure that the most relevant questions were asked. Across the six volunteers interviewed, a number of different roles within the organisation were covered, including trustees, technical volunteers, interviewers, transcribers and the woman who manages the organisation. The interview transcripts were analysed using thematic analysis techniques. 
with an initial round of inductive coding carried out to highlight things noteworthy in the data before a second more deductive round of coding was used to identify elements of the data that particularly aligned with the key areas of this study and from this three core themes were identified. The first theme is called preserving authenticity. The interviewees stressed the importance of preserving memories in a way that kept the authentic voice of the person intact and that it was important to share first-hand accounts rather than an interpretation of what was said, with interviewees saying things like, it's the people telling their own stories rather than somebody else interpreting it, and it's all their words, it's just not necessarily all of the words. Um, although this second quote suggests that memories are edited, and this is something that's focused on more in the second theme. It was also apparent in the interviews that asking people to recount and recording their memories made them feel value and highlighted that ordinary lives are valuable in the historical record. For example, people realised that they were valuable memories, local history-wise and social history-wise. There was also a sense in the interviews that it was important to record and preserve accounts from people whose voices are often missing from the historical account, such as those of the working class. As the manager put it, a lot of men in the area feel that shipyards have never had the personal workers' voice expressed in a formal historical sense. This quote is also interesting, as it suggests that what the organisation does represents a formal historical process, which would seem to contrast with the desire expressed by the manager elsewhere that the organisation can connect with local people because it's a grassroots organisation, with her saying, it's ordinary, it's not presented by a history or a group or a university, it's people meeting people and seeing material that they're familiar with. So, moving on now to the second theme, which is called authority in the archive. Making the memories accessible to others was seen as an important aspect of the organisation's work. As one interview we put it, the point of this is to share the memories. There's not much point in storing them and locking them away. But it was acknowledged that for this to happen, the memories needed to be processed, with one interview saying, we'll try to use the interviewee's words, but we might cut chunks out to make it more of a story. The idea here being that a cohesive story is easier to engage with than a messier, potentially more complex raw transcript or recording. There were also concerns amongst those interviewed that a lack of processing could lead to the publication of content that might not be appropriate for the organisation. With interviewees questioning whether material was right for our website, do we want to talk about this issue? And there was a desire to maintain the good reputation of the organisation as this was felt to encourage people to engage with them. It helps us our reputation because people know us and they trust us. However, while there were concerns about what sort of material was appropriate for the organisation to publish, it was apparent in the interviews that the organisation was aware of the dangers of showing an uncritical, nostalgic view of the past and that it was important to acknowledge the hardships and challenges people face. For example, the manager said, if they were made redundant, you're not going to say, well, I don't think we should talk about that, because that's part of their life. The third and final theme identified was called Towards Permissive Archive Technologies. The interviewees were generally positive about the use of technology in the organisation, providing the technology was supporting the organisation's work rather than driving the agenda, with them saying things like, we don't want to be driven by technology, we want to be enabled by technology. There was also an acknowledgement that there was probably more that could be done with technology, but that those involved lacked the understanding of what was available and how to utilise it best. For example, saying things like, we're not limited by technology, I think we're limited by our lack of understanding of what could be available. And there was also an acknowledgement that for some people in the organisation, a lack of confidence regarding technology held them back rather than necessarily a lack of knowledge. You still need technical knowledge and technical confidence, one interviewee said. As was highlighted in the second theme, there was concern with ensuring that the content remained suitable and a desire that any increase in use or openness of technology still needed some controls, as in this example when talking about the organisation's website. You need to manage your website, and even if we got more people on with the ability to edit the content, we would obviously make sure it was right before it went live. There were also concerns with using technology, especially ones that might be more open and allow for more dialogue, if this might lead to abuse and negativity directed at the organisation or those featured on recordings, as is evidenced in the concern about social media, with one interviewee saying, we didn't go onto social media for a long, long time because people behave differently on social media. So, from the findings, 
It's clear that the organisation wants to be open and capture the authentic voices of local people. However, it was also apparent that they saw value in some editing of material, especially that which made material more accessible by creating stories out of the oral history recordings. However, once an editing process is undertaken, decisions inevitably get made about what to include and therefore what to exclude. There's a danger here that by selecting and editing material, the organisation could end up creating a form of localised authorised heritage discourse, with the material selected telling only one story of the area, even if this story might challenge any national authorised heritage discourse. In a sense, this is perhaps inevitable, as for the memories to form a useful archive, there has to be a structure for managing this, otherwise it will be chaotic and usable. Using technology in this space can lower barriers to participation and access, but technology use in and of itself does not make things more open. Technology needs to be designed and used in such a way as to support greater openness and dialogue in the historical narrative, while allaying the fears of damaging the organisation's reputation or creating a chaotic free-for-all. The challenge, therefore, going forwards in this space is to negotiate a way to create a structure for archiving and sharing material while avoiding creating and reinforcing one particular narrative. So in conclusion, as has been highlighted, there are many opportunities for creating open, multivocal participatory heritage projects, but these projects have to be structured in a way that supports this. And further work in this area is needed to explore how best to create more open platforms for local history, which allow for discourse and different voices while avoiding an unusable free-for-all. Okay, thank you for the showing the video, Paulina. And there are two two very quick questions, um, uh, actually three uh, in the chat. Uh, very cl clarification question. Then we will have a longer conversation afterwards. I will no. I will summarize them. So the first one is you no. Know, Ati the the um, Violetta in particular is wondering. Uh, who owns the interviews legally? I guess from that point of view, no. So are the you no know, of the people who gave you no know, who told their story or the orga or the volunteer organization and so on and so forth. And the other two um, quick questions. So one another also from Violetta is you no. Know, in this you no know, paper, you focus on the volunteers and the organizations there. In your research, are you planning to actually talk to the people who have you no? Know, uh, told their stories um, or so, so the interviewees. And related to that, um, Oswald is asking oh, if you discuss this conclusion, no, and that is not because it's interviews, but I think it's another thing. Did you discuss your conclusion uh, with the people, with the six people you uh, are based this paper um, on? Uh, so those are just no, Somehow, yes and no question, basically. And, uh, please. Yeah, so um, in response to you, I'll, I'll chat quickly about Erta's, Violetta's questions first. And also just to say to Violetta, I did get your email. I didn't get a chance to respond prior to this, but um, I will be responding. Um, so I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> um, so uh, my understanding is that the, because the organization, when they collect these uh, interviews, they, um, they fill out people with um, sort of consent forms and things. So my understanding is that um, people give permission for their recordings to then be archived by the organisation, uh, who then I think claims the the copyright on the on the audio and the recordings. Um, although there is always a way that people can ask for things to be removed um, from the archive. And sometimes that has happened, especially where people have who given recordings and then they've died and then the family have come across it and they have then asked for that recording to be removed because they don't want that in the public domain anymore. Um, so they do have processes um, for sort of dealing with that. But the understanding is that you kind of give it and then the organisation publicly shares that because um, that's part of what they're about. Um, and in terms of um, this bit was focused on the organization. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm continuing to work with the organization and probably because of the sort of further questions that I'm asking, which um, start to talk around sort of where 
the sliding scale of like mod content moderation and content curating kind of come together. I'm sort of um, working more with the organization than with the interviewees, just because that kind of fits more with the questions that I'm asking. Um, and also from a practical point of view, they've been collecting these recordings since 1997. So actually some of the interviewees aren't around to be spoken to anymore. Um, and I have, um, in terms of Oswald's uh, comment, yeah, I have um, chatted with, it's hard to tie them down because they're all very busy retired people. Um, but um, I have um, shown um, one of the guys who's a trustee who I have subsequently had conversations with, I have shown him the paper and chatted to him about the paper and um, it's sort of informing like further work with the organization because this is just like stage one of, of a bigger project with this organization. So yeah, we are trying to work, I'm trying to work with them in dialogue, not kind of be like, you know, I am a researcher, I know everything, um, if that makes sense. Thank you, thank you very much. If there, it seems there is no other clarification question and then we will have time for a longer conversation. Uh, so we can we can move to the next video that, if my memory is correct, is Marta's. Marta is here. Uh, the paper is now uncovering the invisible layers of local values with map-based questionnaires. And you know, somehow is another way of uh, seeing what people consider important uh, in the in their life and, and the place they're living. So we can I think we can start the video. <laughs> So hello everyone, uh, my name is Maciej Jakub Świderski and together with Marta Dusi, uh, we are going to present our paper titled Uncovering the Invisible Layers of Locals Values uh, with Map-Based Questionnaires. Um, in our research, we are trying to investigate the connections between participatory mapping and uh, heritage management discourses which are more and more preoccupied with the importance of intangible values. So something that, at least superficially, cannot be easily mapped. Uh, such intangible values are, in the vast majority of cases, yet to be uncovered, a task that comes with a rather important responsibility towards local communities. In our research, we are asking who is to uncover these values and for whose benefit. Are there representatives of local communities well equipped enough to do it by themselves? Furthermore, we are also trying to evaluate whether the methods we propose work towards facilitating such an exploration of intangible values. Uh, we will now look at two case studies where we are conducting our research revolving around the use of map-based questionnaires. Pondering on the question of whether this type of uh, method is sufficient to stimulate a grassroots exploration of different types of intangible values. So the first case involves uh, five small municipalities in the Puglia region in the south of Italy. The area is characterized by, the, by a rich cultural landscape, which is, to a certain extent, neglected and threatened by ongoing transformations. The questionnaire here aimed to investigate the correspondence between the heritage felt and experienced by the local community and the official heritage by, defined by the authorities. To investigate this concept, participants were asked to map their own personal heritage, framing it as places of the heart. In this way, participants were freed from uh, the official heritage categories, such as archaeological sites, natural sites, or historical buildings, and could express their preference on a more personal basis. The questionnaire was filled by over 150 uh, participants, and uh, over uh, 250 places of the heart were inserted on the map. Uh, many of these inputs were coinciding with the official heritage, but many others uh, were not. Uh, of these, many places were related to personal experiences or memories of the communities. As the participant composition concern, uh, a wide range of ages was reached, from, one, from 25 uh, to over 65 years old, as well as different uh, professions and education levels. However, the majority of participants had a high education level, 80%, limiting to the remaining 20% the contribution of less educated people. And this, in this case, was the limitation. 
and uh, just like me, our second case study comes from Poland. Uh, it is the neighborhood of Usunów, located at the southern edge of Warsaw, the capital city. Uh, this area poses another type of challenge from the heritage perspective, as it is composed of a number of large late modernist housing estates, which in total are home to almost 150,000 people. Uh, definitely not a regular area for exploring heritage, which is precisely what attracted us to it. Uh, since the physical landscape is very repetitive and can even be considered boring in its mundanity, most of local values are cherished by the residents deep in their memories and emotions relating to this landscape. The questionnaire was designed to help the locals link these memories and emotions to specific places, which they subsequently placed on the map. Um, <clears throat> and similarly to Marta's case in Apulia, also here we managed to gather slightly less than 150 respondents, but in total they provided a whooping 1100 answers to uh, which we were able to map. The respondents and uh, their answers covered virtually the entire neighborhood, as you can see on the map uh, to the left. Uh, they disclosed places which seem to be important for the entire community, places which uh, they like for personal reasons, places which they dislike, and areas which uh, should be preserved. Uh, all of these answers were accompanied with uh, short stories, uh, producing approximately 100 pages of raw text. And despite all the positives, we were faced with a very low representation of elderly residents. So those who logically should have been able to share the highest number of memories. So whether a simple math-based questionnaire can indeed effectively stimulate the general public is not possible to determine based on just two cases. However, the result obtained point towards some promising outcomes. Indeed, the questionnaires proved to be an effective tool to facilitate the soft after participant self-reflection and open the floor to investigate and represent individual perceptions and values. However, it needs to be pointed out that in both cases, not all the personal values have been represented. It is essential to acknowledge that with this tool or any other, probably, it is possible, it is, it is not possible to represent all the voices of a community. Um, therefore, an effort <coughs> needs to be made in order to include participants from, more variegated, from a more variegated demographic group. Addressing heritage on a more personal level proved to be an engaging, um, engaging for a larger amount of people. And from the feedback given by the respondents, also the tool was found engaging and they appreciated the obtained representations. However, some part participants pointed out that they would like to see their inputs used somewhere. Therefore, it comes, becomes clear that from the respondents' point of view, uh, the research should be uh, put into practice rather than being a mere exercise. Additionally, we want to point out that these uh, maps cannot can be considered as an ended product. Indeed, in order to make them as inclusive and representative as possible, they have to be open and upgradable. In simple words, as the value, heritage and perception are constantly redefining concepts, so they have to be the layers on the map. Um, both cases have been used in a, as initial stage of a more extensive process. In the Apulian case, after conducting the questionnaire, co-design workshop have been organized. The, um, here, citizens and other stakeholders have been invited to work on a heritage valorization strategy, starting from the questionnaire results. In the Ursanov case, the questionnaire results will be used to develop a game-based experience to which both residents and planners will be invited and the entire process will culminate in a reflection workshop. With the combination of the questionnaire results and the use of these particular uh, types of workshops, uh, we argue that it is possible to make this process uh, more democratic and inclusive. In fact, they facilitate multivocal representation through maps and drawings, uh, the exchange of ideas, and minimize conflicts. 
here we added also some reference uh, we use, but of course in our paper there are more, so if you want to read it. And um, the next. Yes, so yes, that's we, it. Are, we are a little <laughs> in conclusion. And thank you very much for listening to us. If you have any question or further, um, you would like to get in touch with us, here over here or our email. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Here we are. I'm wondering if there is any clarification question for Marta. Uh, otherwise, I have a very quick one uh, because in the paper there is also an interface of this map-based questionnaire. And uh, but what what is what is the mapping technology that you used? Uh, uh, is it OpenStreetMap, uh, Google, Bing? What what is it? And the application it's called Maps. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you can choose the background of the map, so you can okay. the type. <laughs> okay, thanks. And uh, so if there is no other clarification question, I think we can, no, there are no applauses uh, in the room and uh, for the paper, it's very nice. And, um, and um, you know, if there are no uh, clarification question, I think we can move with the next video. Uh, that is actually Mariana, uh, is here to answer the question as is the single author of a um, paper called From Protest uh, to Policies uh, that takes you know, um, a different um, angle on participation in defining uh, space. Uh, please. Hello, I'm Mariana Moraes. I'm a Lebanese in my project from protests to policies navigating between streets and institutions towards democratic cities. Although we've been talking about protests and housing access in Berlin, Germany, I would like to start with this image. This is in Brazil, and the sentence is saying Brazil, indigenous land. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, Kaigan and Shoklan, the traditional owners of the land where I was born. And I pay my respects to Elden Spice and the multiple indigenous groups that are currently fighting for land demarcation in Brazil. So, coming back to Berlin, Germany, this image we are seeing a lot of people in the center of the city with some posters. And in this one, for example, uh, we have the sentence in German saying, We all stay. So this protest was after the, the fall of the wall, not, not some years after the, the fall of the wall. And people are saying, we, we want to stay in the city. But after the, the, the fall of the wall, all the reunification process also changed uh, the housing situation in Berlin. So when we are talking about participation, uh, we are talking about protests, campaigns, open discussions, occupation of public space. So that's why I'm saying that participation is multidimensional. We are not considering only citizen assemblies and the council, all the institutionalized instruments, but also how people can also clan and have different relations in this uh, boundary between state and, and society. So we are talking about opposition also, we are talking about negotiation, we are talking about cooperation as well. This image, we are seeing again a lot of people uh, in a demonstration in Berlin. Now, almost 30 years after the previous image, again fighting for housing. And here is Deutsche Wohnen and CEO Einstein. This means the expropriation of Deutsche Wohnen, which is a company, a corporate landlord in Berlin, uh, and all the companies that have more than uh, 3,000 3, apartments in Berlin. So this group started uh, in three years ago. Uh, it was like a group of tenants is appointed with all the services provided by this kind of company. And okay, they started to call for socialization of housing, for expropriation of these private landlords. Um, when I started to think how I would analyze and the, 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 effect, the, the impact of these kind of, of initiatives in urban policies, 
I thought also to think about some criteria because I was analyzing direct voting and also representative and deliberative space. And, and if I, I'm, I proposed this form based on some reference, these four criteria. So the first one, formalization, uh, uh, is related to how the procedure is institutionalized. If it, it is embedded in a in constitution, for example, at the federal level or some municipal policy, for example. Openness, it means uh, what are the opportunities to participate, how this procedure can combine in recruitment methods. For example, this is, is open to all, <coughs> I'm sorry, or is a lottery, for example, and the participatory dimensions, how we can combine these different institutional and citizen initiatives as well. Inclusiveness, uh, the procedure, how this procedure can really uh, reach this out in underrepresented groups and vulnerable regions in the city, and influence how, when we have a procedure and we have some output related to that, how this output can change the outcome, how this is affecting, uh, for example, a law or some some another uh, process that we are talking about. Now, applying this criteria to the analysis of this uh, movement, uh, I'm just highlighting here some findings. This one, for example, regarding formalization, is the proactive use of legislation. When this group started, they saw uh, an opportunity on the German constitution because in the article 15, they are already calling for socialization of uh, some public uh, resources. So how we can uh, build an argument based on, on a legal statement? And also they combine it, uh, a political slogan. So here in this image, we are seeing uh, in time and again expropriation in a, in a housing building uh, and how we can combine this okay this socialization but also some uh, call for that we can base it on our, our mobilization around the city especially in a city that there is a different relation regarding this uh, what what the meaning of socialization for the city was it is it was divided so how we can also use um, another term to somehow uh, address these calls to a private uh, for in, in this in this context to uh, corporate landlords right uh, openness in this case uh, talking about opportunities to participate how the combination of institutionalizing and basic practice can somehow improve the mobilization so here we are seeing someone signing uh, the campaign for the referendum and it was a large number of signatures to really uh, be able to, to, to pass this referendum and something a constraint, a constraint in this point was um, voting rights because some uh, people who don't have German passport couldn't vote, couldn't sign to the, the campaign to the referendum and we have also a lot of uh, discrimination in all the housing process so how people who are not German can also participate. In, in this case, the campaign collected political signatures, which means they collected a signature for everyone, to everyone, uh, cover everyone. So they could also somehow express the voice of people who uh, couldn't vote in a formalized process. And it's important also to emphasize that opportunities to participate doesn't get, uh, ensure uh, a high degree of inclusiveness. So how we can also overcome some barriers to participate and the German language is also a barrier. So for example, the campaign created this working group in English called Right to the City Group. Here we are seeing this uh, magazine and also uh, this cheerleading group performing. So how we can also use different body languages also to express the voices. And here, influence, um, when we, we see some direct voting process, sometimes we just are talking about yes or no, how is it, what is, we are seeing in this image, so when we find yes, uh, saying yes, for socialization in this case, but how we can have a process that's not just an event, not just a yes and no event, but a, a, a really, collective process that we can have deliberation, we can hear different 
devices we can have instances in different parts of the city to to really create a meaningful process so to conclude uh, in September last year, the majority of people in Berlin uh, voted yes for socialization of housing. So now the Senate is dealing with this, uh, with the, the claim of more than one million of people. And what is fascinating for me in this campaign is how they really use, they could use uh, all these constraints, all the, these institutional constraints to really create a plural participatory process in the city. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, it's a very nice. Another wonderful video. Of the, uh, so is there any clarification question for Mariana? Oh, you are getting a rounds of applauses, and that is gone. Well, that is nice. And uh, uh, yeah. So if there is no, uh, um, I have one question for you, but it's more more than a clarification question. I would say so. Let's keep it for later. And um, no. And um, so if there is no clarification question, I think we can go um, look at the last video. Um, so we can know that is designing uh, the paper is titled designing via the tools um, and is no we have here Oswald to answer the question and I think it's also probably Teresa in the room um, and um, why patterns may save the suburb and this is no uh, another different uh, way of looking at the relationship between participation and space and uh, please. I would like to begin with a first analysis. Suburban Flanders is increasingly facing ecologic, economic and social challenges. The two infographics on the slide focus on infrastructure. The one on the left visualizes how 14.2% of all surface in Flanders is paved. This makes us the concrete champion of Europe. The right visualization illustrates how the costs of maintaining all this infrastructure is 10 times higher in a suburban than in an urban context. These costs make planning professionals and policymakers claim that suburbia needs to transform. As you can read on the left, our former Flemish government architect states that building detached buildings should be considered criminal from now on. The right diagram estimates how many billion euros the government could save if we would stop the ongoing suburbanization process. Luckily, we know how suburbia needs to transform. We need to do more with less space, meaning we need to densify and diversify our suburban environments. And we need to introduce more collective dwelling models. In short, we need to make suburbia more urban. Planners and policymakers have been claiming this for decades now. And we did have some impact in preserving valuable nature areas and agricultural land from being built upon. But at the same time, our models and strategies could not stop the growth of suburbia. Most people in Flanders still dream of a detached single family house located in a quiet and green environment. Taking some distance, a possible reason for the poor impact of our efforts might be that we focused on the wrong leverages. With this scheme, Donella Meadows explains the principle of system thinking and argues how in order to, ch to change a system, it is not enough to change the physical parameters. One also needs to change the underlying system structure and culture. Applied to suburbia, it's not enough to simply add more buildings on less space what we may have been trying to do so far. We also need to work on the underlying dwelling culture. If we then focus on this dwelling culture, then we see that it's very dynamic. People change and so do their dwellings, dwelling needs and aspirations. To meet these needs and aspirations, they transform their houses and their neighborhoods. For instance, two neighbors sharing their garden so that children can play together or a company turning its garden into a playground for the neighborhood. 
we planners want to transform suburbia well it is already transformed if you want to follow meadows and steer this dynamic dwelling culture we need to understand it first if we zoom in on these transformations we can distinguish two categories spatial transformations like an inhabitant turning his front garden into a vegetable garden or social ones like a collective turning from a party collective into a caring collective during COVID. This brings us to our second conclusion. Those suburbia might already be transforming, and though some of these transformations do address some of the ecologic, economic and social challenges that we started off with, things transform too slow and too ad hoc, as these two images illustrate. Where does that leave us now? To put it simple, with two approaches. A first approach on the left side of the table, introducing alternative spatial principles and models. And a second approach on the right side of the table, steering the transformations already taking place. We evidently need both approaches to save our suburbs. In our article, we claim that in order to bring both together, we need to organize collective learning processes in suburbia. We relied on expensive learning developed by Engström and Sanino and simplified their seven step process into a two step process. In step one, imagining, we ask our participants involved in our learning process to imagine new transformations. In step two, relating, we ask our participants to link these new transformations to existing transformations. Both steps expand their current way of looking at suburbia. If we apply this framework to our two approaches, then we need to enable two types of conversations. One departing from visions and models, trying to relate them to suburban dwelling cultures, and one departing from existing practices, trying to relate them to larger dynamics and challenges. In order to allow exchange between all these conversations, we work with patterns, with each pattern referring to one prototypical transformation. Think of spatial transformations like a front garden turning into a vegetable garden, or a social one like a party collective, or a turning into a caring collective. And with each iteration in our conversation, we come up with new transformations, which we translate in new patterns, resulting in a dynamic and enabling suburban pattern language. We already applied our approach in conversations with policymakers, spatial planners and residents. In the second part of this presentation, we will produce two prototypical conversations. The first starting from the right side of the table, and a second one starting from the left side. Our first conversation is about a front garden, somewhere in a suburb. As you can see on the right image, it is very paved. As a first step of our conversation, we ask the participants to imagine transforming their front garden into a vegetable garden. And to then collectively assess the implications of this decision. We do this by asking them some questions related to activity theory, symbolized by the triangles in the right frame. As a result, the participants expand their conception of what a front garden could be. The result of this step is a new first new pattern, that of the vegetable front garden. As a second step, we ask the participants to relate this new transformation to existing transformations, either within or outside the neighborhood. For instance, Another neighbor who recently installed a rainwater tank. A neighbor who became too old to maintain his front garden and removed all his plants. A random person who each summer turns the street into a playing street for his kids. The participants have to relate to a minimum three of these transformations and imagine the implications of this coalition. Such as considering a collective rainwater tank involving a professional to man manage all the front gardens in the street and so on. Again, we end up with a new pattern, this time one of a vegetable playing streets. 
We imagine that with each iteration, the support for larger transformations increases. So no longer on the scale of one parcel involving one actor, but involving multiple parcels and multiple actors. So no longer a vegetable front garden, but a, a vegetable street managed by a vegetable collective. Our second conversation takes place in the same suburb, but this time starts from a policy perspective. And as we argued at the start of our lecture, these typically talk about densification, diversification, and so on. In this case, collective housing. In the first step, we again ask our participants to imagine the implications of this transformation, which would require the demolition of nearly all existing housing and the building of additional dwelling units to make the project economically feasible. In a second step, we ask our participants to relate this new transformation to existing transformations in or beyond the neighborhoods, such as the presence of a strong inhabitant collective, the dream of this collective to build their own neighborhood center, and so on. We end with defining new patterns, this time multiple ones, as we started off with a big ambition. As our second conversation continues, we imagine that with each iteration, the radical policy vision gets more ground, no longer involving the whole neighborhood, but engaging with the particular dwelling culture of neighborhoods. To conclude, we started off saying that these are two approaches to retrofitting suburbia. One that tries to introduce radically new spatial principles or models, and one that tries to steer the existing suburban dwelling culture. Our conversations suggest that there's a third approach, one that challenges both the visions and the culture by ma making people think on an in-between scale. The vegetable street instead of a vegetable front garden, a collective parking and storage space instead of a massive co-housing project. This brings me to my last slide and to the title of the paper, Designing via Detours. We no longer propose to transform suburbia via ready-made master plans or by surrendering to the suburban dwelling dream of inhabitants, but by expanding the current way of looking at suburbia by inviting participants to explore other scales and coalitions. Not random ones, but ones rooted in the culture and the history of the particular suburb. In the end, we will have increased the public value of suburbia, be it not with a predefined roadmap. Thank you. Uh, so we have now uh, gone with the video. There is a, a clarification question for Oswald, uh, while there are no uh, round of applauses. So I need to find the question between the applauses. And, um, but please, uh, everyone feel free to share question for the entire um, group of speakers um, in the chat. Uh, so the, the uh, question Oswald come you know, says, you know, some transformation are both spatial and social at the same time. You know? And uh, uh, for example, yeah, the community garden and so on. What, so um, have you, the, the question is, have you developed uh, some you no know, subcategories to classify them. You no, know, have you you know, how, how have you, you know, have you classified somehow? If I interpret the, the question correctly, you no, know, have you classified somehow there's you no know, um, different forms of transformation you you are engaging with or representing, for example, in the I guess also in the pattern somehow. And uh... Uh, thank you for the question. I hope. Uh, you can hear me because the my connection yeah, is not so stable good. yeah um no we didn't and we're stri still struggling with this if if it makes sense to define categories or not we think as our project will go on maybe clusters will appear but so uh in our among our researchers we don't agree whether we need to introduce them yes or no so it's still a, an open question thank you thank you is there yeah that question was no Coming from, and I will ask, let me see. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, so is there any question from the audience for everyone? Otherwise, I have a question for you, for all of you. And uh, 
No, I enjoyed a lot uh, reading reading your papers, um, and one of, also one of the reasons I enjoyed them a lot has been that they know that they all deal with with space, uh, but with very different angles. No, uh, Mariana's paper, for example, is basically describing and commenting and trying to understand um, a social. Um, process and initiative and uh, political action that took place in which it's not really clear in the paper you know, how, how, how uh, you were involved, Marianne, in this action or not, and what has been your role as a researcher. But you, know, you are basically, the paper describes and comment on it, and that could be done you know, from various degrees of, of participation of, of the researcher to the initiative. While other, you know, Oswald paper is more you know, stating a uh, uh, debate among uh, um, urban planners and say, okay, you no, know, this is what we have done so far. Let's try to find you no know, other ways of of you know, engaging um, with the problem, with the, let's say the ecological problem of suburbia and the cultural one that comes with it. Uh, but it's really written. You no, know, I think that I think the first three words are we urban planners or something like that. So it's really written from that perspective. Um, and is you know, posing a problem from that perspective. And it's also interesting because at some point there is a questioning of you no know, polarization and trying to avoid polarization while you no know, Mariana's case is more of these people are in a conflict themselves, you no, know, and they negotiate and then and, and so on. While Ati and Marta work differently, you no, know, Ati is trying to work with the people who are developing their own you know, form of oral history and try to help them do what they have decided to do and uh, and engage with them in that perspective. It will be interesting for me to know, you know, if you started working with them for the research or you were somehow a volunteer involved already or the, what is the relationship? While, while Marta is, you know, the papers describe the first step of longer processes um, in which the point is, you know, the, the, the initiative is a research, also the, the structure, the sentences of the paper are really, you know, all those are the limitations of our methodologies, really testing out the methodology as, as a research mean to, to let, let's say, the places of the art or the memories and the heritage, you know, the, what, what people care about, to let that emerge somehow, or make it visible so it can be, you know, used in other contexts. Then my question you know, is, you no, know, if you no, know, if my summary is not correct, please correct me. Uh, but you no, know, but my 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 question is, you no, know, we we know that space often is you no know, um, under the you no, know, we have this conflicting tendency. You know, on one side, there is the ecological issue that is there, and we have seen it everywhere. You no, know, here in Olborg, there are 24 degrees today. That is something like you no, know, only for summer, real, real summer, not no, not August in Denmark. And uh, so it's you no know, that we all have you no know, the the environment and the ecology are are, you know, are forcing um, humans somehow to re reconsider the relation with space. But then we have these other forces in which basically space is good as long as it provides value you know, and it generates value uh, from you know, the economic point of view. And uh, because we are in a capitalist society and this is you now uh, space is you no know, David Harvey work, for example, shows how you know, space is uh, transformed by the needs of capital of accumulating. And, um, and so, I'm wondering in this perspective, what do you think is the role for you know, um, for you as presenters in this, you know, for you that have decided to take part to PDC, for you researchers that somehow you know, relate to PDC? You know? So what do you think in your case is your role as a researcher in all this tension? How do you try to position yourself? Uh, uh, this is you no... Know, Somehow my question, I don't know if I've been clear or I've taken too much time because I can be very talkative. And uh, and I don't know who wants to you know, um, answer first. Uh, I could give it a go. Um, please, you... please. Uh, the, the, um, how I see our role, um, my second slide showed our uh, state architects who took the role of putting things on the agenda. 
and um, putting uh, using numbers to show the urgency of having to change our ways of dwelling. And I think we more take, um, I mean, we're part of the problem. Yeah, we're part, as, a, as that's why I write in the we. And we use explicitly expensive learning because expensive learning is about slowly pulling, asking small questions. What if you change your way of living or, or your way of collaborating together slightly? Would that work? Okay, can we then take another step? Can we then take another step? So we explore together with those who live there, local authorities, local designers. Can we slowly, not slowly, inc incrementally, incrementally uh, try out new ways of working together, looking at ecological or social issues. And maybe a, a nuance to my comparison to the others. I think I feel much uh, in line with uh, Hattie's presentation that we, we collaborate with representatives of citizen collectives, not directly with the citizens, all citizens directly, because we leave, believe they are organized, they have a way of working, they uh, are experimenting themselves, so we, we work with them. Okay. Thanks. Then I guess somebody else wants to go next. Otherwise, no. Ati, you have yeah. been basically. Oh, Mariana, please. Yeah, I can continue. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good moment because yeah, I think I can see cl clearly that that our position is really different. Like also than mine, for example. Yes, I was really involved in the campaign. I I, I thought it was like clear in the in the, the paper, but. I see myself uh, in the beginning, yes, I, I started as a researcher, but I see myself more as a facilitator as well when I'm uh, researching movements. So as Oswald said, yes, sometimes group they already have like our dynamics, their own tools, their own models like, and ways of then organize themselves. So my, my role at this point was more how I can support, because if I'm researching, then for me, at least it's very important to, come to, to build some trust. So how we can, we can exchange and also support each other in this process, what I am also bringing to this group. So not only like taking from them. Mm -hmm. So my position was more how I can help you as well. And they started for sure, for example, uh, designing images for like Instagram sharing, for example, uh, I start to support in, in basic things in the daily life, in protests as well, like uh, supporting some uh, posters and these kind of things. So my first, my the way that I found to somehow build this relationship was more basic in, in being a facilitator. So I am also, so I think I navigated in this researcher mm -hmm. and activist at the same time during the process. Thank you. Okay. Somebody else? Oh. Uh, yeah, so like yes, like I so um, um, I just thought it was really interesting, uh, Mariana saying about getting involved in the group because that's uh, not for this case study, um, but from the another case study in my PhD, that's what I was trying to do and be like part of a group and almost a bit of sort of um sort of a slightly ethnographic angle to being involved and, and working with with the group. Um, and it was actually through a member of that group who told me about this other organization working in the area. And that's how I came across the oral history organization. So it's kind of sort of, um, you know, knowledge sort of builds once you sort of get into that world. Um, and certainly when I, like I say, when I work with them, although I'm not kind of, I totally agree with, with like what Mariana's saying that you don't kind of if you're working with a community group it's really nice to sort of be more like part of that group and not and not just kind of come in like as a researcher and be a bit aloof and a bit sort of stand standoffish so um certainly although I'm not actively sort of going out and interviewing people I certainly want to like work in a way that's like helpful for that group and that anything that I come up with and design like they can do that in a way that they can like then use that going forward and when I finish my PhD it doesn't just all fall apart so yeah, that sort of sustainability and communities, I think, is, is like really important when in, in from a sort of designing and participation. It's sort of almost like the participation goes both ways. It's not just us kind of going in and go participate like to me. You know, we need to participate with the people as well. Um, so I thought that was like a really 
interesting uh, point. In terms of space, it's quite it's kind of uh, an interesting sort of relationship to space because uh, on the one hand, I'm quite interested in the idea that actually um, history doesn't have to be like monuments and buildings and history is kind of what everybody carries around with them, like their own story. That's valuable. It's it's valuable to hear someone's experiences of what happened to them at school or their experiences of the war or going to the sweet shop. And you don't necessarily need a big monument, you know, to, to do that. Um, but I'm also interested in what um, putting like memories actually into places kind of helps people's understanding. So actually if you're outside the building that used to be a school you can listen to people's memories of going to that school and if that adds to people's experience of um of exploring um so rather than just sitting at your desk listening to oral history recordings online whether if you're actually out in the environment that adds different layers of meaning to the experience and that's something that i've been exploring on the back of the research that i did um so yeah those questions in space are interesting ones to like negotiate from my point of view. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, there is a comment on the, in the chat by Valeta. Uh, I don't know if you want to make it, turn off your video and camera and, and make the comment and self if you can turn into a question. No? Hello. Um, Hi. Can you hear me? Because my, my headphones broke, so I'm not entirely sure. That's fine. <laughs> this one's all right. Um, yeah, no, it was just, um, yeah, I guess a, a starting as a comment that um, um, very recently I also well, was experiencing the presentation of oral histories at the Berlin, Mo uh, Berlin War Memorial um, in Berlin. And that's very powerful, uh, you know, people, like it was uh, capturing memories of um, at that specific place, how, you know, people leave and jump off there and the windows, this was at the very uh, initial days of, of the wall being built, not like later on uh, when it was, when it became cement and, and concrete. Um, but, and then there, the spaces of their housing disappearing. So that, I think it's very, yeah, it is, I would, argue that it would be quite emotive, um, Hattie. And um, also there is another project, um, a kind of um, um, part of uh, we're augmenting Luxembourg with um, uh, oral histories uh, as well, uh -huh. but through a phone line to make it more accessible to people who yeah, are yeah. not able to um, to use technology or what for. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's fascinating. Uh, so I will stop my comment here, I guess if anyone wants to be responding to it. <laughs> because I come to Lux. Yeah, my, my wife lives there. So I come there from in Belval from time to time. And uh, no, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think it's very interesting what you're saying because I think it's also connects and maybe, you know, uh, I would like to get Marta into the conversation because I think it connects a lot with, uh, with uh, what Marta also is trying to do you now. But this mapping, this you no, know, you call them the places of the art uh, in Puglia that you now bring all this emotional um, aspect. But I found it very, I found interesting in your contribution this you no know, um, idea of you no know, bringing them and put them into a map because that gives also a sense of the geography uh, of them and. Uh, but I'm wondering, because I know the, the, the Luxembourg case that Violetta is mentioning is actually very interesting with the phones. And, uh, and, um, and um, oh, how, how, how do you want to use them? You know, what, what is the goal you have on eliciting all these you know, emotional, let's say, uh, memories? You no. Know? Yes. Uh, so the, the goal was um, first to collect uh, with the question and that uh, can reach a broader public uh, all these uh, elements on the map uh, because maps are used basically by planners and uh, so the, the objective was to kind of uh, collect information that can be used actually for planning purpose after all. Um, but the, the aim was with the questionnaire to involve the whole community and then with the workshops to collect uh, smaller groups of stakeholders involving both the citizens but also public authorities 
uh, and so actually use this uh, map result and uh, also um, um, opinions on how the landscape, for instance, the cultural landscape could change. So, for instance, the question uh, uh, were also about uh, integrating renewable energy. And uh, so we uh, asked the community how they would like it to happen. And we could uh, represent these as infographics uh, and so on. And this information could later be used in these workshops as a starting point, let's say. So, yeah, as researchers, I think we positioned ourselves a bit as uh, uh, mediators between the, the, the public and the institutions. And uh, this, I think, was the objective, keeping in mind the already existing project, because the first step was also to look what are the actual projects ongoing in the area. Um, but also, of course, aiming to sustainable development goals, for instance, and, and so on. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And uh, okay. yeah, I can see. Uh, um, yeah, there is a lot. Unfortunately, I think we have two minutes to the end. And I will. No, uh, I'm sorry because I would have liked to have another thirty minutes. And uh, because I, uh, yeah, I'm wondering, and I put it as a provocation before moving to the schedule of, of next time. Is just you no. Know, I think when when you were talking, Marta, what comes came to my mind was that you no, know, Mariana was mentioning that she produced content for you no know, Instagram and stuff while being active uh, and helped you no know, paid pictures and that as certainly because you need to do that you know, to communicate some effective dimension, I suspect. And so what came to my mind is how all these you no know, representation of what we have. Um, play differently into into a variety you know of of you no know, uh, change processes at the end because all the papers you know are dealing with forms of change and transformation somewhat more explicitly and you no know, and um even though know, Ati was dealing explicitly with histories arguing against questioning established narrative through this participatory oral history thing so it's it's, there is something that is very um, fascinating, but we can't go on, unfortunately. And uh, but uh, uh, but there are comments there. But I need to you know, Paulina. We can remember uh, you no know, uh, what's coming up uh, next and share the slides on that. So this is you know the full uh, thing. So what we have uh, tomorrow. Early morning, uh, no, not, yeah, uh, early morning UTC, and depending on where you are, uh, um, you know, a full paper talk, uh, and then followed by other two full paper talks, uh, exploratory paper talks just afterwards, and then all situated actions uh, on um, past the parcels. Um, yeah, so this is you now what expect us tomorrow. Uh, I hope you will all join something. I'm finding the conference very, very engaging and uh, promoting. And I want to thank all of you for being with us and answering our questions and and so on and, and giving us the chance. And uh, thanks also uh, the people who are being active uh, in the chat. Uh, and have given us no uh, interesting cues. And um, so I have a see you, see you soon, I hope.